My name is Jocelyn Bonadio de Freitas. As Jennifer mentioned, I'm a new host at WQXR. I'm thrilled to be here. Um, Arturo is my former piano teacher. <laughs> <laughs> Still learning former. from this man all the time, though, so um, we're, we're good friends, and I'm thrilled to be here. Um, I, of course, we're here to um, hear this amazing music and hear about your recent trip to Mexico and participation in this event, Fantango Fronterizo. But if you'll indulge me for just the briefest of moments, I want to tell like a micro story. I'm a new radio host, so this is something I'm practicing and just really enjoying doing at the moment. Um, so I'm a new host, and I, I, it wasn't so long ago that I was looking for work. And I was talking to a friend of mine about how difficult it is to find really meaningful work. And he was like, you know, that, that's the American question. What do you do? Everyone asks you that if you're, if you're on a date with somebody, if you're trying to get to know someone, um, an in-law or someone you're meeting for the first time, that's the question you ask them, what do you do? And it, it just didn't quite sit right with me. And I said, you know, I think we've moved on. And I think the question now is, where are you from? Yeah. Where are you from? Um, and, and that effort to just try and literally place somebody. And uh, as I was researching this event and, you know, kind of rereading the bios of, of your band and the people that you chose to invite with you, 
Um, it's right there in the first line of everybody's bio. This is an Iraqi musician, a you know, Chilean French musician, a Mexican musician. It's right there in the first line. And even though uh, musical language is something that really transcends borders, that's something here that we're celebrating tonight and that you really celebrate in the way you make music, um, we're still, there's still so many musical traditions and even instruments that are really place-based and really specific to a place. Um, and one of those is Son Jarocho music, which is a folkloric Mexican music tradition from Veracruz. And that's sort of what Fentengo Fronterizo is all about. And it's a very communal style of music. Um, so I'm curious about how you sort of entered into that tradition or approached it, maybe more appropriate way to say, and what your kind of intention was when you found out about this event and, and why you wanted to go down there. Well, I just, you know, I, I have to just preempt this a little bit because you made me think about an incident where I was sitting at a, a, a wedding at a table and somebody said, well, you know, you're very well known, you have lots of Grammys, but what do you really do for a living? <laughs> so we still ask the same questions. Where am I from and how do I relate to this? Yeah. I don't think of myself, uh, defining myself on as, as a single in finite point, either as a human being, ethnically, or musically, or even culturally. And I think of myself as somebody more who exists on a continuum. I mean, there's all kinds of blood in this person here that comes from all over the world. Um, and so the beautiful thing about Fandango Fronterizo is that I don't try to mimic that Stone Hot Ultra music. I don't try to pretend to play music I don't understand. My objective is not to show anybody how to do anything or actually to try and show off in any way. My objective is really to learn. And I found that uh, Son Harocho music is, is, it just reminds me of Delta Blues. It's so pure and so powerful and you can't fake it. It is music that comes from deep within your soul and there's no amount of conservatory training that will do that. Not that there's anything, anything wrong with conservatory training, but trying to be something you're not, trying to do something you're not, trying to define yourself by a larger margin is to deny the ambiguity that all of us occupy. We're all part of an ambiguity, and some people hate ambiguity. They hate it because it means that they can't be in control. And so looking at these lovely people in Mexico and what they do is a celebration of the deepest, deepest, deepest roots of all of us in our lives. Absolutely, and something really unambiguous about this event is the border wall. So literally something specific about this event is that musicians on both sides of the border wall in a park that exists partially in San Diego, partially in Tijuana, literally converge at the border wall on either side and play this music together. It's freaky. It's freaky to see families that have been separated by decades uh, essentially sing and dance together inches apart separated by the thin wire mesh, so thin that you can barely put the tip of your finger through. The closest you're going to get to that cousin or aunt is touching fingertips. It's really heartbreaking. Um, and so they get together, and what they do is they destroy the physical, political, and geographical boundaries that separate us. And I thought that was such a poignant lesson. What a meaningless exercise, what an archaic, insane exercise it is to build walls. It's a solution, let's face it, that, that doesn't even exist. I mean, we know that most illegal immigration comes by people overstaying visas. Uh, it's just, it's, it's insane to think that a wall can do anything but serve as a reminder of how childish we really are. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I love that, and I love the idea of using community in a subversive way to subvert the meaning of a wall meant to divide and use it as a site for communion and communal gathering. Because um, you didn't also just go down there by yourself. You brought not only your ensemble, but this also extra community of musicians with you. Can you talk about, about sure. that and who you chose to bring with you? I was uh, really moved by uh, Jorge Francisco Castillo, who's one of the founders of this Fandango Fronterizo. And in fact, the, he says the most brilliant thing of all, and he introduces this event every year, he says this wall has actually not divided us, it's united us. And I wanted other people to see that. I wanted my musicians to see that. I wanted guests from all over the world, and I wanted to obviously make a point too, so I invited 
uh, friends from all over the world, from Iran, from Iraq, from Mexico, from the United States. I invited the Afroland Jazz Orchestra, Regina Carter, Antonio Sanchez, the Villalobos brothers, and a crew, crew of literally dozens of people to come witness this miracle. Because once you see this, your life is transformed. And I think that, that more than going, again, more than going, cultural diplomacy is not going somewhere and teaching people how good we swing. You know, cultural diplomacy is going somewhere and thanking human beings for changing our lives irrevocably and for challenging us to be better. Yeah. Um, I think the other really beautiful part about um, this project, and I felt so privileged to be able to investigate it through you going there. I can't go. I mean, I, I could go down to San Diego, I suppose, but I, I didn't know it existed until you kind of brought this attention to it. And um, one of the most beautiful parts about it is that it presents a counter narrative about immigration um, through the arts, through music. And we have uh, two really dominant, contrasting narratives about immigration right now in the news. We have a narrative from the White House about ICE and law enforcement and criminality. And we have this other narrative about families being separated and detention and kind of an inhumane uh, act and, and, and justice system, and, and it's kind of incomprehensible. Um, and so I wanted to ask also, what was the, the narrative, whether it was somebody you met or a moment that, that totally surprised you and kind of broke apart what you, you thought you knew? I feel like that's one of the most valuable things that, that art and artists can, can help us with. I have to say the defining moment for me was being an immigrant myself. I mean, the defining moment for me was walking off a plane at the age of five and thinking, wow, I belong here, and then realizing over many years that it's not quite that easy. So walking off a plane, we, we often think of you as a Cuban musician because of your father's lineage, but you also have a Mexican. I was born in Mexico City yeah. and, uh, and grew up in uh, the United States, and uh, really, it's a really interesting process to grow up here and not be part of the dominant culture. And uh, the thing is that in so many ways as the time evolved, I realized that none of us are part of the dominant culture. And none of us really are, uh, we're all immigrants and the people that belong here are Native Americans and we're all kind of just borrowing their land. In fact, we stole it from them. So um, let's stop the bickering and bitching and start realizing that we're all kind of in the same boat that you can't blame little brown people for uh, the rape and pillage of this uh, economy. You can't, we, we didn't do it. You, I asked you about a moment and you went there really quickly. <laughs> I didn't mean to, I'm sorry, I apologize. <laughs> no, you don't have to apologize, it's fine. We're all, we're all here for it. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm also curious about, you know, the music that we're hearing is not Son Jarocho music, obviously. You spoke about the fact that that's not really your tradition, per se. You went down to witness that tradition. Right. Um, but So tell us about, about the music that we're hearing and how it revolves around this trip or, or what you've been inspired by recently. Well, the first piece we played is actually from the Yucatan. It's a Yucatan folk song, and uh, it's called El Makesh. The second piece is really painful to me these days because it's about, it's called Yorona, it's the, it's the, the a woman wails over her lost child. And in this particular day and age when we're seeing families ripped apart and women and uh, children, you know, crying out in pain because of this ridiculous moment in history, that's, that's an, an entirely too close to life for me. And uh, the third piece we heard was Intruso which is really called kind of an intruder piece, and it's about the intrusion of one culture into another culture and demanding that it is the sovereign culture when in fact it is not. Um, so all these pieces are directly related to the cause, the idea of Son Harocha and what we went down to accomplish, which is just to question everything that we take for granted. Absolutely cool. Um, I'm, and the last question I think I have, and also, um, by the way, if, if you're in the audience and you have burning questions, we're going to hear some more music and then have a Q&A portion, so just hold on to those, or if something is coming up for you and you really want to ask Artur or one of the musicians about it, you'll have the chance to really soon. Um, given that you know we don't always, again, sort of hear about this uh, Mexican side of your identity or what that, that means to you, um, I'm curious about how this, uh, this music and this exploration and, and also just this kind of painful political moment 
feels relative to a Cuban musical identity and a, and a jazz musical identity? I think my identity is, is, is very fluid. I think there's a lot of fluidity in it. I think musically I relate to Cuba. Culturally I relate to Mexico, but both are in obeyance to Africa. And because uh, that's where we're all from musically to some degree. It's so fun to talk to you. <laughs> and it's so fun to hear you play. Wasn't it fantastic? Thank you. Okay. Um, well, thank you for indulging me in this fun conversation. Um, I really look forward to, to getting to know you guys, whether it's on the air or after this event. We're going to bring the band back out so we can hear some more music. Um, they're back there somewhere. Probably. Is there a bar back there? Yeah. <laughs> Carly there Carlos they are. Maldonado. There they are. Welcome Juan to the Carlos back Polo. Yeah, for Latin Jazz Ensemble. Kaysel Jimenez. <laughs> David Nevis. <laughs> Rafi Malkiel. <laughs> Yvonne Renta. <laughs> Walter Stinson. See you soon. So we're going we're gonna to play a little bit of, of new music for you. Uh, this piece is a piece I just wrote. It's... Uh, called Tiny Little Men, which I know is not a politically correct term. So I'm going to just call it Tiny Little Algorithms, um, if you will. And uh, then we'll perform for you um, Ish, a piece which has a polite title and an unpolite title. Uh, for today we'll call it Trump on Trump. <laughs> and strugglets, just to keep everything in relation.
Give it up again for Arturo O'Farrell and the Afro-Latin Jazz Ensemble. That was so fun. Is the band going to stay? Is the band going to stay? Is the band going to stay? Okay. All right, audience. Yeah, keep it going, keep it going. Keep it going. Okay. So it's your turn. There's some microphones uh, floating around out in the audience. We will come to you if you have a question that you'd like to ask Arturo. As he dries off. Yeah, well, that's not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> I this sweat. I'm schwitzing. Sorry. <laughs> it's, it's the summer. You're allowed it's to schwitz. It's fest. fine. What can I tell it's you? A, it's the peak of summer. Does anybody have a question that, they, that they'd like to ask? Yeah. Here, you can use my microphone. Let me just write down the numbers. So when you come up with these interesting, provocative titles, <laughs> do you come up with the title first, then the music, or the music, then the title? Or Completely the opposite. Everything I do is narrative-driven. Like, I just, I don't know how to compose in the abstract. And something has to deeply move me to get me to uh, put notes on paper. And it's usually a story, an injustice, a person, or something that's going on in my life. So in addition to the title, do you usually have like lyrics in mind for the whole piece? or? I'm a frustrated songwriter, uh, a frustrated like lyricist. That's the truth. You pegged me. <laughs> well, maybe you should uh, act it out. <laughs> Any other questions? One in the back? Someone's coming with a mic. In, in terms of writing the parts, the individual pieces, I'm most curious about how the percussion pieces get written. That's a good question. How does, like, I, I think that traditional notation is a necessary evil. And uh, what I try to do is write so that my musicians ignore what I've written. They know better what to play than what I write, and uh, especially when it comes to percussion. As a percussion, you can, there's 200 examples and variants of bomba rhythms in Puerto Rico. 200. 200 variants, at least, that we know of. So trying to write them out is a little bit like repeatedly punching yourself in the head. <laughs> we have one more in the back. Well, I'm sure you consider all of your performances important. I imagine during a career there's been one or two moments that stand out more than others, and uh, what would those be and why? One of those moments happened, uh, and it was directly related to the green space, was the opportunity I had to write uh, for very controversial figures. Some people uh, might not like Dr. Cornell West, but I think Dr. Cornell West holds our feet to the fire. And um, <laughs> One of the most significant moments of my performance career was being able to perform the Cornell West Concerto at the Apollo Theater with Cornell West. And uh, it was very moving. I remember we, we end the concerto with this very uh, sweet, sweet hymn. Um, and I remember looking out across my musicians' uh, faces and seeing some of them weeping which I just, I just find it so emotional to let yourself go to that place where you're not ashamed or afraid to cry. Thank you, Ar Arturo. Um, because of what you told us about your experience in the, uh, by the border, I just want to ask you uh, what is coming up? Um, are you planning to go back to the border? Are you already engaged in that process of, um, I forgot the name of the, the, the Fandango, the Fandango, Fandango Fronterizo. Fronterizo. Okay. We'd actually, believe it or not, we, we've talked about doing a similar experience at the demilitarized zone, <laughs> the Palestinian border. We'd love to bring the idea of the Fandango to the world. Lots of questions here in the back. Just one more. Can you talk a little bit about some of the programming you're doing with young kids and the educational programming you're doing in the public schools? Absolutely. Um, I don't believe that music is uh, an abstract art form. You have to teach it and give it away because eventually you're gone. And so we've created a, an organization called the Afro-Latin Jazz Alliance, and we have a beautiful and uh, boisterous education program. We're in the New York City public school system. 
Uh, we serve 14 New York City public schools. We uh, buy instruments to give to kids, and we actually go into the school system twice a week throughout the school year to teach them how to play them and to teach them how to play in an ensemble way that we could all learn to do that. As a matter of fact, uh, we also have a, a pre-professional training program called the Fat Afro Latin Jazz Cats, which is a, a you know, it started out with eight kids. I just went into you know some schools and said, let me have some students. And uh, it's now up to three youth orchestras, which I lose track of their names, so I just call them by Lucha Libre names. Like if the beginning orchestra, I call them Los Gatos Gordos. <laughs> the middle orchestra, I call Los Perros Flacos. <laughs> and the elite small ensemble is called Los Monos Enojados. <laughs> we had the privilege and the honor to bring the Fat Cat Kids just a couple of weeks ago to Cuba. We actually brought them to meet their colleagues in, uh, in, in Havana at the Madeira Rodan Conservatory. They had concerts, they had times to uh, just hang with musicians their age. And I gotta tell you, that is the most powerful thing that we can do as human beings to our young people. You, you, it just strikes me that you don't have to do this stuff. You know, you have uh, an orchestra. This is like a subset of that orchestra. Um, you, you come from a, a musical legacy, frankly. Uh, you're an amazing teacher, I can attest to that. But just as a performer, multiple Grammy Award winner, you know, you don't have to do activist-oriented music. You don't have to teach and, and run an organization that does educational programs. Um, how do you, th that's a lot of energy and time and, and, and just, it's just frankly not something you, you absolutely have to do given your positionality. So how do you? It's not altruism, it's not generosity, it's selfishness, man. It's just the joy of seeing other people do their thing and be allowed to express themselves in ways that I was allowed to when I was a kid. So it's really my way of just being available uh, in the best manner that I can. It, it feels good. I think, I think we get to hear one more piece. I think we can. Yeah, one more piece, right? Just one more piece of music would be good. Thank you so much for, um, for being here tonight. Thank you, yeah, come on out, come on out, guys. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Thank you for listening. Thank you for caring about um, this music and uh, this event that you went and attended and that has a really current um, and really just palpable of the moment kind of flavor to it. Um, I know we didn't speak you know, directly, directly to politics, but, but we did in our way. Um, and so I, I really appreciate you all being here and being a part of it. So give it up one more time for our Turo Farrell and the Afro Latin Jazz Ensemble. Had fun. Thank you for being a gentle and wonderful audience. <laughs> one more.